Phil, we're very glad to have you back. <laughs> we took our kids to the park in the borough on Wednesday, and we're driving back. And we're saying, so Phil, and it's Phil running his bike. Hey, Phil, and you just got in. You want to share anything real quick? Yeah, he's, Phil's going to be um, our fifth Sunday of each month is Missions Month, so June 30th is the fifth Sunday of June, so Phil's going to be sharing. You just take a couple minutes and just say hello, and yeah.
support women with babies to born as well. You know, we have to do both. So James and Anna in their new house settled in. There's a, their house is still on the prayer board back there. Yeah, so we're praying for it. Uh, we, we had some guys line up to help, and I was talking to James this morning. He finished before we were able to help, and I said, wow, that's so thinking to myself, it's not like, Friday. knock stuff out. And then I was uh, <laughs> task oriented. We were going to, me and a few guys from the church were going to go up and help him. He called me about 12 o'clock. It's like, I'm done. <laughs> so, uh, so we're glad and happy for you guys. So there's a Chick-fil-A in Warwick. They have to visit Chick-fil-A. Is that where you're at now, Warwick? Kids can uh, go, go to their classes. <coughs> James, if you'll not be embarrassing, you and Jay had their anniversary yesterday as well. And, and your birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday before the kids went off. Happy birthday. Generosity and patience. 
For the last, especially in light of my closed-mindedness and hardness of heart during my time at Chi Alpha. No matter how immovable I appeared, all of you never gave up on me and responded only with kindness and Christ-like love. That spoke to me. I never give up on somebody. For all of that, I'm sincerely grateful. And now I'm part of the Christ body. I felt called to share the good news with my brothers and sisters in Christ that the seed you sowed so long ago was not consumed by the birds or fallen poor soil, but actually lay dormant until the Lord thought it was time to germinate. And that just really spoke to my heart for a multitude of reasons. And, and you know, Yale would be a tough place, I think, yes. to be a missionary yes. <laughs> and to reach these kids who were really professionals. Um, you know, sometimes we're called to remove, renew our minds, not remove our minds. Yeah. God, we need our minds. Uh, but sometimes we can be so intellectually uh, attuned that we lose track of our spirit as well. Okay. And I think that's a challenge that they wrestle with. And he had spoken, they never gave up on this guy. And he reaches out six years later and says, thank you for being Christ-like in your love to me and never stopping. And the seed that you sowed didn't germinate. It might have taken some time, but it germinated. And I read this. I didn't tell my wife I was going to share it. And she read it. This really spoke to me. I was like, I need to share it with the church. So we give to him every month. Reaching scholars at Yale. That's what he calls his ministry. So... Uh, Amen to that. That's good, good stuff. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, does anyone else have any announcements? Anything that God's done in your life this week that you want to share? Good. Bob? Yeah. I, I got a word this week that old the uh, kingdom of God is, is a legal kingdom. And it doesn't break any legal laws. It does things by the book. And so... Of course, what book? What the Bible? So we can get into the into the Bible and find out what the laws are, and they don't change. And you know, we're members of this kingdom that we. A guy like that, I mean, he's going to go. He's going to. He's going to talk to people who are going to get into business, and they're going to they're going to say, okay, what, what's God going to do with business? He's got nothing to do with business. But actually, God wants us as business people, if we're business people. To go by his word because it does, it's not a contradiction. It's just you know. So when, when they get ideas and you know they they could be more successful business people out there if they just went by God's word and heard God's voice and listened to what God had to say. God, that's, that's for me. That was a word this week that God goes by the law. If we would just go by it, it, would, it wouldn't. We wouldn't. You know, be wondering what to do next. It's a good point. One of the things on my heart I would love to see is because I, I believe the kingdom of God it works in the dirt. It doesn't work in the dirt. I don't want it. So I can apply the principles of the word of God to the kingdom of God. I was just talking about Chick-fil-A and a Christian organization. And they do things on a Christian way. Their business flourishes and prospers. And to think that way, you know, if I have if, if there's Christian business people and they say, I apply principles of the word of God to my business, God prospers it. <laughs> you can reach people who are secular business people through the Word of God and say, this, these work for me. Where did you get this from? It opens up a door. This is found here in the Gospel of Luke. You know, the Lord spoke to this. He said, it's a ministry. Amen. So I can thank you for sharing that. It's very true. Anyone else? Do you want to pray for your friend, Mary? Uh, Mary has a friend, Cheryl. Well, that's my sister-in-law. No, that's your sister-in-law, of course. It's your sister-in-law. And uh, she's uh, having some issues diagnosed with cancer. But she's still having some issues. So just as, a, as the body of Christ, we just join and pray for her. And she's in California, is that right? So, Father, we lift up Cheryl to you. Lord, you know her inside out, Father. She loves you. Lord, I ask that thank you, Father. Lord, that healing is the children's bread. And you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. So just as she's there in California, Lord, that you would heal her from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet, and anything attaching itself as Bob, who's the Lord, illegally to her body as a daughter of God, we command that to go in the name of Jesus Christ. By the blood of Jesus, by a broken and shed body, Cheryl is healed. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And Lord, I also, Lord, I pray that you speak peace to that family. Lord, that the peace of God that passes all understanding, Lord, fills her heart, Lord. And Lord, that in this season, 
Lord, that she's able to draw closer to you in a way she's never done so before. And we love you. We thank you for a good report. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So keep her in prayer. Uh, let's quick at that memorial board I talked about a few weeks ago. We haven't forgotten it. My wife has one, and we're going to put it up. She's going to find the time. Uh, I think we're getting a babysitter this week, so my wife can come up here and do some stuff. And I want to have things we pray for, uh, things that we celebrate, things like what Cheryl's going to happen with her, and placed on the board to say, this is things that God has done. And when I laugh and I doubt, and say, hey, well, God did this, this, this. Do you have something against him? Yes, but you also pray. I have a friend, Diane, who is kind of intensive care, and actually she's on life support. Father, we reach down uh, to where this, this woman Diane is with your hands. Learning, learning more and more and more. 
I describe it as like a never-ending pasta bowl. We ever go at the Olive Garden had those years ago, and we keep eating it. It's like it never goes away. It's like dill. And I look at the Word of God, I've got to keep eating, and I keep eating, and I keep eating. I think I've got to the bottom, and there's more that populates. <laughs> and so just approach the Word of God like that. And I've been talking about the parables of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is life. It's life, it's life, it's life. And Jesus was describing it, and we discussed in Matthew 13, Jesus transitioned his ministry. This is a key chapter in the gospel is Matthew 13 because he starts speaking in parables. And parables conceal truth from those who know everything and they reveal truth to the hungry. Amen? It goes back to what I said before. If I tackle this, yes, I, I'm guilty myself. I've read this. I know what it means. Let me move on. And my truth can be concealed from me. But if I approach it, I've never read this before. Remember I shared the, the thing the man said uh, pastor in South Africa a few weeks ago and he made the statement, this man memorized a large portion of the Bible. He says, every time I read the Bible, I say out loud, I've never read this before. Never read it before. And I come into a hungry, ready to receive from the Lord. Amen? And parables can do that. The Lord can speak in parables. His disciples and those who are hungry receive the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The Pharisees who had already written them off and knew everything they didn't know what he was talking about. Amen. And so we've got the different parables. One's the parable of the soils. If you remember that, just like the guy from Yale talked about, the seed you sow, you sow is on good soil. Is everyone here comfortable, by the way, temperature-wise, before I go on any further? It's going to be a little cold. You're good. Okay. And there was four different soils, and Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a soil. You're going to throw it. Three of them are bad, actually. One of them is good. He says the kingdom of God is also it's like the wheat and the tares. Remember, we're good and the wheat, wheat and the tares both grow up to the end of the age. It's not our job to remove them. The Lord does that in the time and explains why I see good and evil at the same time in the world. Okay, it's very helpful. He goes on, talks about the mustard seed. Not only is it the seeds that sown to the ground, but the kingdom of God can be small, but it's powerful. And it grows like a mustard seed into a big tree, birds. The air nests on its branches. And last week we spoke about the influence of the kingdom. And now let it come in and bubble up. It's like the Spirit of God within us. I think today is Pentecost Sunday, actually, is it? Yeah. Uh, and so it's like the Holy Spirit within us. And what happened on the day of Pentecost? The Spirit of God filled disciples and the church grew. Amen. I spoke in other tongues the Spirit gave utterance. If you do not pray in tongues, say this. R.A. Tori says it's the birthright of every believer. And just my little plug on Pentecost Sunday. Pray in tongues every day. If you pray in tongues, don't put it on the shelf. And something I've been practicing, I mentioned this, I'll come in here by myself, pray in tongues out loud, and do it as long as I can. And it's a workout in the spirit. I promise you it is. <coughs> but it builds up, remember in Jews, it's building up yourself in the most holy faith, praying in tongues. I build as I go and I pray in tongues, as I pray in tongues, as I walk around praying in tongues, my spirit is built up. <laughs> I feel like I've just lifted, you know, 500 pound bench press in the spirit. Amen. I encourage you to pray in tongues, pray in the spirit. And so I want to look today at the parable of the hidden treasure, and it's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. And this parable, along with the parable of the pearl of great price, it speaks to us of walking in the kingdom. And as Bob said, there are principles of the kingdom of God. And Bob, I would just encourage you, if you get those, you write them down. Write, them, write what the Lord gives you. Put it in a booklet form. Do something like that so you can store it. But there are principles of the kingdom of God, and this is one of walking in the kingdom of God. And it's just simple. It's one verse. And it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Okay. Marjorie gave me a book this morning that I'm looking forward to reading. It's about uh, the long road when Jesus walked and what Jesus was speaking to us and what the scriptures see as Jesus walked from place to place. And I'm a big believer that when I read scripture, it's understanding context is very, very important because it gives me a much richer meaning. And in this time, this parable is something that everyone who listened would have understood as far as the context of it. 
like me and Owen were out, if you've been to our house, I think most of you have, you have this big area in the back, and Owen has his different areas he goes in and chops down the branches and makes his own little place. And he was talking to me, he said, wouldn't it be neat if there's treasure buried here that I found? It was a few weeks ago. I said, yeah, I, I, when I was younger, I had a little sandbox under where I buried this little treasure box. Someone will find it someday, you know. And my uncle, uh, who's with the Lord right now, he was he used to he was a unique man, and he used to bury his money in the ground. <laughs> that wasn't so unique back then. It's what they did. Right. And so the banks they didn't necessarily have you know Chelsea Brock down the road. People hid their treasure underground, yeah. and uh, the area was also very known. Josephus talks about this, the Jewish historian, it was known for war. There's a lot of war and battles there. And so it would be very common if I have treasure, I bury it in the ground, and I know where my treasure is when I go into the ground. And so in this parable, it's, it can be interpreted different ways. I'm going to go at it from one angle this morning. But the man of God, I don't know if he's working in the field or he's doing something. Let's say he's working, and he goes and he's digging, he's find something, there's a treasure, he opens up the treasure, and he's a shrewd businessman, and he says, you know what, I can take this treasure, liquidate all my assets, use that treasure, and I'll be wealthier than I was before. He says, the treasure, God compares, and Jesus in this parable, he says, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like the treasure. I'll sell everything I have to get that treasure. Okay? One more quick point, it's not the point of the parable, but in case some of you are thinking, some people struggle because they feel like there's an ethical dilemma with this. You know, like, oh, he was actually being dishonest. There's a rabbinic law, and it says this, it says, if a man finds scattered fruit or money, it belongs to the finder. In other words, the Jews he was speaking to weren't thinking, man, this guy was dishonest. They say, wow, no, he found the treasure in our rabbinical law, the treasure belongs to him, okay? If it belonged to the guy in the field, he wouldn't have had the man working in the field. So in the context of it, people buried their treasure. This man was digging. He said, this treasure is unlike anything I've ever seen. You can sell everything I have and be a wealthier man. And I do it. And so that's what happened here in this parable. This is interpreted different ways. Just bear with me. I'm going to do it. Now. Some people look at it as Jesus purchased the treasure, which we are. Is this true? purchased and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But Scripture also speaks of treasure in other ways. And I, I love the passage. When I was in Bible school, we had to play our picture. There's a verse, like our Bible verse. And I used this one. It was, I rejoice in your word as one who finds great treasure. Psalm 119. So word is treasure. And Matthew 6.21, it says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It talks again in Matthew 6, which I might look at some way or maybe. But don't lay up yourself a treasure on earth where moths moth and rust destroy or thieves break in and steal, but lay for yourself treasures in heaven, right? There's treasures on earth and treasures in heaven, okay? And where am I looking at it and, and where am I going with that? I'm going to look at just two points. I'm going to be brief this morning uh, because I, I want to... I have... 11 pages here worth of stuff that I compiled, and I'm going to really abbreviate it down because I feel like there's a couple of points that I want to give. One thing I love to do, when you remember when Rick Vargas was here, I was talking to Peter about it, one thing Rick Vargas would do, and he's a storyteller, and he, when I listen to him preach, he makes me feel like I'm back in the, in the setting. He's a much better storyteller than me, but he's, a, he's able to take me back, and I feel like I'm there watching the scene unfold. <laughs> And sometimes it's healthy when I read the scripture to imagine what was going on. I can read it in one second. I can read this passage in a few seconds. It's one, it's one verse. But imagine what happened in it. And a good way to think of this is what happened when the man, he found the treasure buried in the ground. And he said, you know what? I can live away at everything I have. So, and I decided I'm going to do that. And you think... Two things. Imagine he was just working 15 minutes before that happened. He didn't know that treasure was there. That will preach in of itself. I'm not getting into that, but there's times in our daily life, off divine appointments, when I'm just 
walking with the Lord, being led by the Spirit of God. I don't know that something's there, and it might be a gold mine right there. If I have eyes in it, and I, I often think, how many, how many of those have I missed in my life? Because I've been so focused on my own world <laughs> that I've lost track of the things of God, whether it's a person. Uh, my mom was sharing with me one time, and all of us have had these experiences where she was in the waiting room with someone, she went to the doctor. She said, I knew I was supposed to pray for that lady. I never did. Never did. And I don't how many of those that we have, I have them myself. I want to be more aware of him and his world than I am with my own. Amen. But imagine he was there and he, and he found it. And he sold everything. And this treasure is the kingdom of God. He said, this is worth everything. It revolutionized him. The kingdom of God, there's a king. He has his kingdom. I was remembering this week when we looked in Acts, and the kingdom of God can be expressed in Acts. And in Acts 13, they were preaching Jesus, the kingdom of God. Jesus is the king. The kingdom of God is all about Jesus. He is. And then we live and move and have our being. There was miracles. A lame man walked. Uh, there were salvations. Philippian and his household, the jailer, the whole household was converted. And there was city transformation. The kingdom of God should transform just like it's living within us and through society. And he found this, and he says, this right here will revolutionize my life. And if anyone, the only one I can, perhaps like the best example, I'm just saying this, who was living a life said, man, everything I had before was just nonsense. Totally. <laughs> just nonsense. You sold it all for the treasure. This is so much better. You know, I always get, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I gave my heart to Christ at eight, so it's been most of my life, and sometimes I don't treasure the BC days, because I don't remember them very well, and you do. And it's just a special thing. I'm going to give it all for the kingdom of God. I'm giving it all for Jesus. But I stop and I wonder sometimes, and I think, what happened to this man in between the time he said, I'm going to go sell everything. So I found the treasure, and I go sell everything I have. What happened if something went through his mind and his family said, why are you doing that? His friend said, you're a fool. What do you think? <laughs> and then he starts thinking, you know, maybe this was all just an illusion. Well, I'm sure that it is. Maybe, this, maybe it wasn't there. Maybe it's not as valuable as I thought. Have you ever been so sure of something and time goes on and you're like, maybe I was wrong about that? I had a case at work recently with that. I was very sure and they kept Maybe I'm wrong, and I start to second guess myself. Mm -hmm. What if there were second guessings going on? He was starting to doubt and, and, and things. I think of Paul when Paul was in jail. He wrote to the Philippians. He said, I count all those things as dumb. And imagine someone going to jail with Paul, then with him in early in his career, and says, Man, you were trained guy by Gamaliel. You could have had a great career, man. You were rising through the ranks. Now you're in jail. <laughs> Think of John the Baptist. And sometimes I think when I sell out the price, there'd be times of wondering, is it worth it? Has anyone had that before? Or is it just me? I'll say it from this perspective. Not necessarily my salvation. Okay? But in, in my life, there's been a moment, not my salvation. Take everything from the world for me. I want Jesus. <laughs> There's a specific instance in my life. I'm not giving you details. I think I might share about it someday. But I said, Lord, I've given all in this area. I've given all for this. And I don't necessarily see the fruit of what I thought I was selling out to. Amen? Has anyone ever had that? It can be a, a prayer that I have. Uh, it can be, you know, God, I, I gave my finances in this area. I gave my time and my energy in this area and I haven't seen it and things start to settle in. And my wife shared an article with me this week. She sent it to my sister because uh, one of my sisters really needs it but I read it and it was really, really good and it was a, it was a girl, a young lady and she had five kids and the last kid uh, was, was bad with cancer. And, you know, the Lord healed him a year later, he was back in there again, and she couldn't quite believe this was happening again. The Lord took care of the situation, he was healed, and without getting into all this story, about a year later, he was still having some effects with sleep. There was a neuro neurological issue, and he couldn't sleep at night. So when your kid's up, 
gear up as a parent. Yeah. You just, you're not going to mm -hmm. gear up. She's gone on and on and she wasn't sleeping. You don't sleep for a while, get cranky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she just started really complaining to God. The Lord really just, just spoke to her and she, she gave a verse. And I love this passage. I'm going to read it to you. It's in Philippians. And this is, again, Paul and the Philippians is known as the epistle of joy. And Paul wrote it from jail. We often forget that. It's a prison epistle. It's an epistle of joy. It says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Often we read that verse, Philippians 4.13, without the context of what he said before. He knew all things through Christ who strengthens me. Later on it says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The context right that before was this, that they had given generously of their finances to him, their earthly treasure to him. And what her point of her thing that she was writing, and it's true, she wrote this, she says, in God's economy, we flourish when our need is met in Him. I like that. In God's economy, our, we flourish when our need is met in Him. And one of the things I think is, the Lord brings us to maturity as children of God is when I can be like this and my need is truly met in Him. And I see too many people in life, I've been there myself, if I just, uh, if I just move to this state, if I just had this job, or if I just had this one, if I just had that. And I've been there and I've done it myself. And one thing I've learned in my life, I got a prophecy one time. And it's been ringing, ringing, ringing true. I find rest, not in my circumstances, but I find rest in God alone. Where He is my treasure. Where I really give all because my treasure is really Him. Rather than my circumstances. So then I go into what is my treasure? Is my treasure a result? Is my treasure, I need to sleep eight hours a night like this lady? Or is my treasure, you know what? I can find rest in Christ despite how I'm sleeping currently. Right? Yeah. It's making sense. Yes. My treasure is found in Him. And it raises me from a place of being here to a place of being connected with Him because I don't need all of those things. They're good. But I don't have to have it to find my treasure because my treasure is in Him. And oftentimes in life, one of the things I would say to this, Jack Taylor made a statement. He said, if you want to know what an idol is, an idol is something you have to get permission for before you say yes to God. And I always remember that. An idol is something you have to get permission for before you say yes to God. And that, that always stuck with me find people sometimes, where's my treasure? Is my treasure really in him or is it in something else? I've seen people in life, no one in here, if you don't get your wheels turning, but I've seen someone in life where something was taken from them and they fell apart. The believer, a solid believer in Christ, but something was taken from them. It wasn't like the fly, it wasn't a sit, nothing like that. It was just a, a thing in their life that they found identity in. Oftentimes I say, you know, if you took this from me, how would I would respond? <coughs> my reputation, my identity, my career, my job, my this, how people think of me. Sometimes I find I can place my treasure in that. <laughs> I, I, the heart of what I'm saying is this. Lord, if my treasure is in you, and if I'm willing to sell everything, my reputation, my identity, my finance, my this, my that, you have to really be my treasure. And if you're my treasure, it means in you I have all and even more. Amen? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and these things shall be added unto you. Can you say the idol thing again? I'm sorry? The idol statement? Yeah, an idol is something you have to check with before you say yes to God. You check with the idol. You have to get permission. So God says something to me and I check and say, Sandy's my idol. Sandy, what do you think about it before I say yes to God? That well, we can talk after service if it's not good. Well, I'm understanding as far as it goes with people, but when you say, I'm thinking idol is stuff. So you. An idol can be a, 
anything that uh, was it Tim Keller says, um, an idol is a good thing that becomes an ultimate thing. An, an idol can be a uh, ministry position. A lot of pastors are idols of ministry. Uh, it can be your job, it can be your reputation, or it could be your money. I mean, it's an idol, something that's a treasure you place over the Lord. So if you say we like that, then let's say it's your ministry position. Yeah. And so how do, so if you're like told to do something in your ministry position and it could affect your something with God so you go to the position before you go to God with it or let's chat after service. Okay. I don't think it's a message okay. flow. It's okay. Yeah. I, I, it's a good question, but we'll, we'll chat after I'll service. We'll clarify. We'll clarify. And so where was that's a good question though. So it's a treasure or something as an idol, something I check with before I check with God. In other words, where am I finding my identity as a son of God? In, in other words, I come to the place, and maybe this will help you, I don't know, we can talk afterwards. Uh, as I speak as a pastor, because I know a lot of pastors go through this, and a lot of pastors will deal with it. And the person I was thinking of before, they're not in this church, because there's no one here, but something was taken away, and because it was taken away, they completely, totally, utterly collapsed. Because their identity and their treasure was in that. And I come to the place and I said, Lord, you know, if you said, Clay, I don't want you to ever be in any ministry position. I don't want you to ever minister again. I don't want you to ever preach, write, teach anything ever again. Would I be okay with that if God asked me to? Or would it destroy me? So then I come to the place as my identity as the Son of God and Him. Is my relationship more? Would I be willing to sell out for the treasure that I found? Or is it too much? I, I, I can't do that, Lord. I'll serve you, but I still need to hang on to this, too. It's where I get my security from. It's where I get my identity from. It's where I get my reputation from. And as Andrew said before, he made himself of no reputation. Just another, I'm going off on a rabbit trail. Which I got it. Yeah, no, no, that is it. Yeah, one thing, and I've said this before, too, just to add to it. Something happened one time where I felt, again, there was no one in here, so I always say that so don't start getting the wells to you. It was a completely separate place. But I felt like I wasn't honored or appreciated the way I should have been. And it bothered me, and it bothered me, and it bothered me, and it bothered me. To the point I said, Holy Spirit, this isn't normal, and it's not good. What are you sharing to me? And he took me in that passage, and he made himself of no reputation. He took the form of a servant. I said, you know what, I have to come to the place where my treasure is him. I'm truly led by the Spirit, and I can do without good things. Right? Preaching and teaching, it's a good thing. Your job's a good thing. Your career's a good thing. There's a lot of good money is a good thing. <laughs> but when it's my treasure, it becomes a problem. Amen? I have one more point that I want to make. A few more, but one more in particular. <laughs> Is this. There's also reward. One of my favorite chapters of the scripture is Hebrews 11. It's the Hall of Faith. Uh, these, when I was younger, there was Carmen. Remember Carmen? Yes. And he used to have it now, Yo Kids. Yes. And they used to listen to Carmen, Yo Kids. And one of the songs was in the Hall of Faith. And that was one of my favorites. So every time I read this chapter, I think of the Hall of Faith. But it says this it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. One other principle in the scripture. My salvation is free, right? And in Romans 3 it says it's been freely given to us. In Ephesians 2 it's not by works. I don't do a thing other than believe in my heart and confess with my mouth. And I trust what Jesus did for me. It's a free gift, right? Um, but there's a passage in I'm here, Isaiah 55, and this is about the Messiah. It says this. It says, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, buy wine and milk, without money, without price. So here's a uh, Messianic uh, passage in the Scriptures. And he says, come, buy, but there's no price. So I don't buy my salvation. I can't do that. There's an element in Scripture where He's a reward of those who diligently seek Him, right? 
draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Amen. So God will reward me for that if I draw near to him. How does he reward me? Draw near to me. Right? Yes. One of the things we have in our society, and I, I understand it, I don't want to get into it, <coughs> but the idea that everybody's a winner, no matter what. I had a teacher in college, and he was really funny, but he was a strong military politically. And he said I was, a, I was coaching my son's baseball team at a middle school. And I made the parents mad because I told the kids if they weren't good enough, I'm not going to play. Play them. The parents would get mad and say, well, they're not good enough. <laughs> he was really harsh about it, but he was like, I want them to learn from an early age. If you're not good enough, it means you have to work. <laughs> and it means I'm not going to be amazing at everything that I do. That's just reality to life, right? And there's a reward to, to putting forth an effort. Ask and it will be given to receive. You shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. That speaks in the original language of persistency. Amen. Diligently seek him. Reward. One thing we do with our kids, and whatever you think about it is what you think about it. I'll tell you where we got it from. Uh, we looked at uh, the minister I mentioned, Bill Johnson. All of his kids are ministry. They're all serving God passionately. And my wife got a book because we, we have three kids. We want our kids to grow up mighty men and women of God. So we look, you know, what are these and all their family serving the Lord. And he said, one thing I would do, I actually heard his son talking about this. They would reward their kids with something practical for doing things for God. And, and one of his kids, Eric, said, my dad used to reward us. He would get us stuff when we read our Bible. And I'd always just read my Bible and I'd always worship just so I could get those things. Wally Pop or whatever. BB gun. He said, well, the day came in my life when I realized I was, I was going to God not to get the other reward. Yes. I was going to God because there's something in me that was just wanting Him. Yeah. And wanting Him. And we got it with our kids, actually. We had Owens reading. He read his whole New Testament. He's in 2 Samuel now. He's a little behind here on the reading plan. But after, after every several uh, <laughs> chapters, after every couple books, we say, you know, you get to this point, Owen, oh, we'll buy you an ice cream on there my heart and my prayer is doing it for the ice cream now, but he's going to, he's getting the word of God in him. And the day is going to come, he's going to say, I, I want to know yeah. what second sin, what, what, I want to know about the life of David. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it teaches him a principle of when we seek him, he rewards us. Yes. I was, he was down in children's church the other day. We were down and we were talking about it. And he never mentioned a reward for it. He mentioned that he was excited to be doing the reading plan and that he had gotten a little behind but now he was caught yeah. up. And <laughs> that was yeah. So I just wanted to let you share that. Hey Amen. That's good. So it's it's already, it's already starting with him. And it teaches them a principle and a value that the Lord will as we seek him. It says also in Jeremiah it says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And it, salvation is free. Our relationship with God is, is free. But it also requires an effort of me as well. It requires a digging into the Lord. And I come to Him in faith, knowing that as I seek Him, He rewards me for it. And that again, for the treasure, as I dig, as I put forth the effort, as I sell all, I get something in return that's more valuable than what I had when I started with it. Amen. And there's something in our society, I look at myself. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll use my generation. A lot of us don't know sacrifice. We just celebrated invasion of Normandy, 75 years. Right. And I think of that generation. And I think, you know, I think they call it the greatest generation. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I compare them, you know, with ours where we have so much and we always want so much more. And I think even when our walk with God sometimes, I can be so used to the immediacy of things that I don't recognize, you know what? If I don't see an answer today for Cheryl, I keep pressing because he's a rewarder for those of you who are see him. Where's my faith coming from? Is it 11 6? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. There's a passage that speaks about it, I can't remember where it is. 
but my faith is not so much in that. My faith is I want to continue to believe. Yes. And, uh, Chris Valentine gave a wonderful example, I'm closing with this. He said, I was out with a friend, we were chopping wood. I've given this hearing sermon before. And he said, I was chopping the wood, chopping the wood, chopping the wood, and it wasn't breaking. And I looked at my friend exasperated and said, this isn't breaking. How long do I chop the wood? And he said, you chop the wood until it breaks. And he said, you hit it in the same spot. And you keep going. And there's something in our life, that, at least for me, one thing I love about uh, old timers, and I, I, you know, I know Kevin's one here, I know he does as well, maybe others do. I love to go back and find people who've gone on to do with the Lord. Because one thing the older generation had that I think some of us struggle with today is they knew how to get in the presence of God. They knew how to get on their knees. They knew how to pray and continue. And my faith is demonstrated not so much when I just, I believe it more than you. My faith is demonstrated that I believe it so much I keep going back to it. Yeah, keep going back to it. Keep going. He's a reward of those who diligently seek Him. I don't feel God. I'm going to keep pressing in because I draw near to Him, He draws near to me. Amen. I haven't seen my friend Hill yet. I'm going to keep pressing in because he's a rewarder. In that kingdom of God, there's healing. And I've sold it all. I'm going to keep digging that well. I'm going to keep digging that well. And there's a persistency that builds and a persistency that builds. And if you remember the parable in Luke 18 of the persistent widow. Living example. My kids do that to me. <laughs> Daddy, I want a piece of gum. Daddy, I want a pack of the gum. Daddy, I know sometimes they wear me down. <laughs> Just take a piece of gum so I can have a minute to think. <laughs> and how shall our Father continually, continually go to Him. We've got to press into Him. In my heart this morning, there's a war again. One little verse, one little parable could be taught many different ways. There's many different principles. There's many different things. But a simple question. Who is my treasure? I dig for Him. I have to seek Him. I have to dig up and find and pull it out. But He's worth it, man. He's worth it. I tell people all the time, my life for Christ. <laughs> you all to Him. Okay? He's worth it. Maybe life with Christ is an adventure. It's fun. It's not always easy because life's not always easy. But in those times, my rest, my, 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 my source of peace comes from Him because He is my treasure. Amen. 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 God, You're good. Lord, I thank You that You can give us one verse and one parable. And Lord, You can speak to us in so many different ways. Lord, I ask that for all of us, Lord, You would show us where our treasure is. <laughs> Lord, what are we investing most of our time in? What are our thoughts? What are our energy? What are our resources in? And Lord, that I, I ask that You would make all of us be a people and be a church who would say, I gladly give it all because the treasure that I find, the treasure that I seek, the treasure that I go after is more valuable than everything I've left behind. Lord, make us a people like that. We love you, we thank you, we honor you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.